here is time now to talk about derivatives. After all, that's the whole point of this class, because options are nothing else than a derivative. So we have seen, we have talked about equities, about stocks in particular, and I mentioned that there are bonds, and I mentioned other things, and derivatives is one of those financial products uh, that are really important to modern financial markets. In a sense, derivatives are very modern products. They, even though some of them exist in, since many thousands of years ago, the formalization of the whole theory behind derivatives uh, has been very recent. I mean, the mathematical theory, the statistical theory behind them has been very recent. And by recent, I mean the 70s, the 80s. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this. The derivatives are very complex instruments. And you can see here in this slide that I have uh, complex mathematical equations used to highlight this. Derivatives are, uh, are very, very complex products. Uh, the complexity is mind-numbling, and the mathematics behind them is gigantic. However, that doesn't mean that we cannot understand derivatives from a conceptual point of view. And in this class, we will try to understand them in that way. So remember that derivatives live, they don't live in their own world. They are connected to other financial products. So uh, that's kind of the key feature of they have. They are not completely free. And for, in, for derivatives in general, the laws of supply and demand don't apply. Uh, the good thing about derivatives, or at least some derivatives, is that they are traded in public markets. Okay, so that's good because we could go to market and buy some derivatives. But in general, most of the derivatives trade in private markets or in markets that are um, beyond the reach of retail traders. Now, most of the interesting derivatives trade in those markets. However, for the point of this class, we're going to talk about the stock options. And options do trade in public markets and have the same features than at least uh, in terms of quotations that the stocks have. You know, they have prices, they have bid, they have ask, and you can use the same orders that you use to buy stocks to buy options. So options are derivatives, and therefore they are also very complex. And I have this in this slide. I have a very famous equation, an equation of tremendous beauty, a mathematical equation of tremendous beauty. And I, the only reason I have it there is just because I want to write the point that underneath the options, there is a whole mathematical body of knowledge. Uh, it's a very advanced topic. And the equation itself, uh, for those of you that are mathematically inclined, you can see it's a partial, uh, it's a partial differential equation. You know? And this equation in particular won the Nobel Prize of Economics for the authors. And it's a very elegant way of modeling option prices. So that's what we are dealing with here. We're dealing with derivatives, we're dealing with options, and we are dealing with very advanced mathematics. But in the Fox level class, we want to understand these concepts at a very high level, at a level of abstraction that is really high. We don't have to get down to all the nitty-gritty mathematical details, but uh, I want to drive the point that even though it's going to be high level, it's going to be connected to this equation. So, so the question is, okay, now we see that an option is a mathematical equation and we understand that there's lots of mathematics behind, but what are options really? And the answer is options are just contracts. It's contracts between two people. That's what an option is. And it's not like stocks uh, or equity or bonds. No, options are is, belong to a different category because in an option, what we are doing is a contract between two parties. And one party has rights and the other party has obligations. And that's the key concept of options. The contract itself is asymmetrical. And in, when someone signs an option contract, one party will have lots of rights and the other party will have only obligations. So you will think that options are new, but they are not. Options exist since long time ago. I mean, options are probably one of the oldest concepts uh, that exist. I think they exist even before chairs exist, before stocks exist. And 
and they are very common. No? One of my favorite examples of auctions, probably one of the earliest documented use of an option is, is a story about this Greek mathematician, it was Thales of Miletus. Thales was a mathematician that against all odds became really rich. Now probably is the only case in history of a mathematician that got rich because he knew mathematics. No? And uh, I love to tell this story because you can see the asymmetry between the two contracts. So Thales, a lot ago, more than 2,000 years ago, back in Greece, noticed that during the harvest of olives, uh, there was a scarcity of presses, you know, the, the machines that you use to press the, the, the seeds and extract the oil, the olive oil. So the, he decided, he saw an opportunity there, and uh, for the following year, after he noticed that, he took an option on all of the presses in town. Now, he went to every single owner of a press at the beginning of the year, and he bought an option to use them during harvest time exclusively. Of course, he paid for the right to use those presses, and notice that, notice that a key concept appears here in this transaction, the concept of a right. So he bought the right to use the press at harvest time. And it was very fundamental, and he did he did the same for every single press in town. Of course, many months later, when the harvest actually came, then he exercised that right, and he was the only person in the whole town that could press oil for the olives, and he became really rich because he had a monopoly on the presses that were required um, to process the oil from oil. So, so that's one of the earliest examples of an option. Of course, this is not the normal option that we use these days, but it's an example of a trade and it happened many, many years ago, more than 2,000 years ago. Options are also very common in the world of sports and, and you, you hear it all the time in the news that this thing uh, had a contract with this player with an option for two more years. Now, you, you hear the word option all the time in sports, and it's more or less the same. It's something that you add to a contract that gives you a right, but not the obligation to follow through that. And that, that's kind of the key uh, concept uh, with options, is that options give rights, you know? and, and that's why the contract is asymmetrical. And there are options in the line of credits and real estate projects, for instance. Uh, like a line of credit, you, you have the money there, is there whenever you want to use it, but you're not obligated to use it. I mean, you, you under, are not under any obligation to actually get the money for the line of credit for yourself. So in a sense, it's kind of an option too. But the common theme across all of these examples, including the one from Tiles of Miletus uh, from thousands of years ago, is that the contract is asymmetric. One party on the contract has is buying a right uh, but the other party has an obligation. So that's the key. Uh, even you know, for this long class of options, I just want you to get that idea in your head. That's the most important idea. Um, and we can see it here in this slide. The most important idea is that uh, there are rights and there are obligations and there are options are a contract with two sides. One side of the contract has a right the other side of the contract has an obligation. More specifically, the buyer is the one that has the right. The buyer of an option is acquiring a right to do something. Like the case of our mathem Greek mathematician, he acquired the right to use the presses, but the seller has the obligation to fulfill the contract. He is obligated, he has no option. The seller of the option must, in the case of Tiles, uh, like the guy on the other side of the the trade with the presses, he was obligated to, you know, let him use the press because he bought it. He bought the option to that. So it exists since ancient times, and I'm pretty sure in your daily lives you have encountered options in one way or another. In, in fact, any event in real life, anything that you do in real life that has a non-refundable deposit is probably an option. That's what it is. I mean, if you make a hotel reservation where they request a deposit that is non-refundable, you actually put an option to use that, that room, no? So notice that this non-refundable 
part is what makes the things optional. You could do it or not, but the other person get to keep that money. That's, that's what an option is.